Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Nina Jablonski. Nina is an American anthropologist and paleobiologist whose work focuses on the social and biological meanings of skin color in humans. She completed her PhD in anthropology in 1981, and she is currently an Evan Pugh University professor at Pennsylvania State University. Her work spans broad yet intimately connected topics such as human evolution, human diversity, and racism. She was recently elected to the US National Academy of Sciences, and in 2009, she was elected to the American Philosophical Society. Nina is the author of several books, including Living Color, The Biological and Social Meaning of Skin Color, and Skin, A Natural History, which examine the biological basis of skin pigmentation, as well as the socio-cultural implications of varying degrees of melanin density. I am incredibly happy that I got the chance to speak with Nina, as I think her investigations into the role of skin, not just from a biological point of view, but also an anthropological one, can help us understand how we can live healthfully based on our ancestry and the latitude that we each call home. This conversation ties in so nicely with the previous conversations I've had on the podcast and hopefully brings a bit of clarity and understanding towards how sunlight can impact each and every one of us differently and how where we live and how much melanin we have can dramatically affect our health. So with all that being said, I really hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you so much, Nina, for joining me today. I've uh, really been looking forward to this. This is sort of a conversation that's a little bit outside my comfort zone, which is kind of why I think it's going to be really good. Um, You wrote a book um, that I read a few years ago called uh, Living Color and uh, all about uh, what skin color means and and how it's come to be. And uh, it really fascinated me, um, all of the different views that all these different cultures have had towards skin color Mm -hmm. over our evolutionary past and you know we find ourselves in a in a weird place at the moment in the world where um i guess a lot of people don't really think about how all these um different skin tones came to be so how did you find how did you go looking for this topic when you were (laughs) when you started your research well, uh, you'll be you'll be happy to know, Cameron, that I actually started it when I was working at the University of Western Australia in the early 1990s, and it started entirely by accident because I was uh, just minding my own business as a uh, as a senior lecturer in the Department of Anatomy and Human Biology, and one of my colleagues asked me to do a lecture on skin for his class in Introduction to Human Biology because he was going to a conference. And I said, yeah, of course I'll do it. So I rifled through my notes from previous teaching and tried to put something together that had an evolutionary slant to it because I knew these students would be interested in evolution as well as the anatomy. And uh, much to my surprise and chagrin, there was very little there. And so, you know, I sort of, I did the lecture the best I could, but it was sort of nagging in the back of my head that there was so little information available on the evolution of human skin or skin color, something, you know, the things that are of really great interest to people. Literally three weeks after I gave that lecture, I was sitting in a seminar being given by Professor Fiona Stanley, now Order of the British Empire, Professor Fiona Stanley, recognized for her excellent uh, epidemiological work, especially on the origin of neural tube defects, uh, a common, previously common birth defect. And she was talking about the relationship between folate deficiency and the prevalence of neural tube defects. And literally, as I was sitting in the back of this seminar room, the penny dropped because I had read a few weeks previously in preparation for my own lecture on skin, an interesting and provocative article from Science Magazine published in 1978 about the relationship between ultraviolet radiation and the degradation of folate 
one of the important B vitamins that is necessary for normal cell production, DNA replication. And uh, although it wasn't mentioned in that article, Professor Stanley's lecture was saying, you know, folate is absolutely essential in early development of the human embryo. So, you know, I was sitting there literally, you know, like jumping up and down uh, um, because I, I was very excited. I realized that this was an important insight into the evolution of skin pigmentation. People had put out theories about skin pigmentation, darker pigmentation being protective broadly against DNA damage in skin cancer, lighter skin pigmentation being important relative to, to uh, vitamin D production. But there was, there was very little in the way of specific mechanisms and certainly the epidemiological evidence and biochemical evidence available at the time didn't, didn't support any of these theories. Although it did provide some, some support for the vitamin D thing, which I'll get to in a moment. But anyway, so, you know, I was really minding my own business there in that, in that lecture room, you know, back in 1991. And, and this, this sort of dropped into my lap. And I realized this is a really important topic that people have shied away from, in part because it's too controversial. Mm. Up to this point, and and in the 1990s, remember we're you know more than early 1990s, we're more than 30 years before the present time. Uh, people were you know far more sensitive about talking about skin color and race issues in Australia, in North, in most countries, in North America and in Europe. And and I I reasoned to myself, well, I think humanity can cope with this now. So so I started doing more work and back then there was really no internet to speak of, so I couldn't, you know, sort of search resources and databases and download stuff. I had to just use old fashioned shoe leather and go to the library a lot and and also correspond with people. And to make a long story short, the the research program started slowly then and it continued throughout the time I was in Western Australia until I left at the end of 1994. And it picked up again when I moved to California in in uh, latest 1994. And basically, it's just picked up ever since. So it started entirely by accident. I was a, you know, sort of harmless paleoanthropologist looking at the evolution of old world monkeys, primarily before I started in this, uh, in this area. But I realized it was of such interest and such potential importance that if I could make a contribution it would be worthwhile and worth pursuing. And when the data seemed to sort of fall together over the years, and it took a long time in the history of, you know, shoe leather and, and you know, old-fashioned correspondence, um, it, it did come together. And by the year 2000, we published our first substantive paper on the evolution of human skin color. And in in that we really brought out the 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 theory that uh, that humans evolved mostly naked skin early in their evolutionary history, probably around one and a half to two million years ago, and that in order to protect their bodies from primarily from the degradation of folate and biologically active folates broadly, uh, that it was important to, to compensate for the lack of fur by having a different kind of sunscreen, namely melanin pigmentation, that would be protective of the body. And we see this throughout you know, mammals and actually non-mammals as well. So melanin, eumelanin more specifically, is a really excellent natural sunscreen. On the 
other side of the coin, we get uh, the we see the evolution of lighter skin with less eumelanin natural sunscreen uh, as people dispersed outside of the tropics, outside of the most intense and non-seasonal sunlight uh, into areas where there was less ultraviolet radiation, especially the short wavelength ultraviolet UVB wavelengths that are important <clears throat> in catalyzing the production of vitamin D in the skin. So it what we described in that original paper and in subsequent papers was what we call the dual Klein or dual gradient hypothesis of, of natural selection promoting dark pigmentation in areas of really high UV and promoting light pigmentation or what we would call evolutionary depigmentation under conditions of lower and highly seasonal UV, especially UVB. And really that was the beginning of it. And when we when we published those early papers, we thought, okay, well, yeah, that's that's pretty much the end of it. But <laughs> what greeted us was a veritable explosion of interest from everybody. We had, you know, neurologists, epidemiologists, science educators, everybody sort of beating, well, not exactly beating on our door, but certainly showing interest. And really, you know, right up to the present day, that's been the case. Wow, that's uh, that's really fascinating how the folate story is what what catalyzed this this realization for you. It's interesting because yeah. my um my background is nutrition. And mm -hmm. I've never had I heard before I read your book about the relationship mm -hmm. between folate and UV light, although it makes mm -hmm. sense because there are other nutrients. I know riboflavin is sensitive mm -hmm. to blue spectrum light. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not new. It's not a new idea that light interacts with these um, yeah. these vitamins in the body. Um, yeah. And obviously, you know, we've got this latitude gradient, and um, if we didn't depigment as we moved further north out of Africa, um, birthing would have become almost impossible because the bones don't yeah. develop properly. And likewise, yeah. if you don't, yeah, if you get too much UV light when you're on the equator, you're, you're not going to be able to birth properly as well because of the folate issues. So it looks right. like we're, we're in this, we're living in a world where we need, there's sort of this Goldilocks loan, of, uh, a zone of, yes. of UV, UV <laughs> exposure where too little is no good, but too much is also no good. And yeah. I think that's part of the struggle of what we're dealing with now is how do you define where that Goldilocks zone is? Yeah. Uh, how do you define it? And then if you can't naturally expose yourself to that sort of Goldilocks perfect amount of sun according to your age, your reproductive status, your location, your ancestry, all of these, these characteristics, then how can you compensate so that you have a balanced physiology? Because one of the, the things, and I'm sure you have discovered this in your own research, one of the things that modern people deal with is living indoors, urbanized life, but especially living indoors most of the time. Uh, an, an issue that has become much more serious in the last 20 years as, pe as people have become more or less enslaved to different screens. Uh, not only the screen of, of their smartphone, but the screen of their laptop or whatever game console. So we have people who are, even in Australia, not getting nearly as much natural sun exposure. Even with some good sun protection, they're not getting any sun exposure to speak of. And, and, I'm afraid Gold, Goldilocks really has lost out in the process because uh, as a result of this, I mean, many people might think that they're healthier for not having any sun exposure. But if you don't get some, then you have to compensate to the best of your ability through changes in diet or supplementation because you just can't think your way out of this. We have 
basically bodies that came out, you know, of evolution a um, hundred thousand and more years ago. Uh, Homo sapiens is an old, relatively old species. Our bodies have been in this condition for about 300,000 years, and we were naked and tropical most of that time, right? You know, and so we didn't have to worry about Goldilocks because things sorted themselves out. But now we have, and, and very recently, we've taken to living in settlements, living mostly indoors, and further, people have mixed and moved all around the world at very, very fast paces over incredibly long distances. So your ancestors came from... I'm guessing here, um, somewhere in Europe to Australia. And, and you know, the, the solar regime that you're experiencing in your life is very different when you spend time outside than the one that your ancestors did, let's say, five or six generations ago. Yeah. Uh, fortunately for me, my father's Maltese, so he's quite dark. So I, yes. can, I can handle the Sydney sun a lot better than most. So <laughs> Yes. Um, thank God for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you mention in the book about this um, depigmentation event, or as yes. I as I was uh, interested to find, it wasn't just one event by the looks of things. That this yeah. depigmentation happened two, maybe three times. Have I got that correct? Yes. Which... And you know, since Living Color was written back in two thousand twelve, uh, we now are much clearer on the genetic foundations for skin pigmentation and more genes are being found all the time. Mm -hmm. Suffice it to say that there were at least two and maybe three, four or more right. uh, depigmentation events that were caused by independent suites of genes that, that brought about depigmentation under natural selection. This is such a fascinating process because it involved uh, humans as they dispersed into generally higher latitude places, having different configurations of genes as a result of moving in small populations, this whole population bottleneck effect, which was so important in in human history we didn't disperse into new environments in you know groups of thousands we dispersed in groups of dozens or a few hundred and many groups became extinct but those who did survive often would have a genetic complement very different from that of their original host population and as a result the combinations of pigmentation genes or genes that could affect pigmentation would be different in these different dispersing populations. So when those groups were then under natural selection in Scotland, Mongolia, wherever they happen to be, the natural selection would act on whatever variation was available. So you find this has been a really fun thing about, about following the genetics is that there are different genes that can cause different outcomes in the production of or, or the lack of production of pigment. And that can happen in any number of ways, depending on where that pathway is interrupted or augmented. So this is this has become a fascinating story of, of trying to figure out, well, okay, you know, in this particular population, the this group of genes must have been there, and they were the, these variants were under natural selection, and this is what happened. Here there were different variants, and it happened that people had access to a lot of vitamin D rich foods as well. So they have a, a different combination yet. So we see these depigmentation events occurring at different times with different complements of diet, sometimes 
quite a bit of vitamin D in the diet. In other cases, not very much. So in the case of, uh, we, we often talk about in the case of Scotland, people dispersing into Scotland, especially uh, early horticultural and agricultural populations, just about 6,000 or 7,000 years ago, people ate fish, but they also lived in one of the most UV-starved environments on the planet that is habitable by people. And so you see maximum depigmentation in those uh, in those people and the the sort of mandatory adoption of a of a diet that is rich in vitamin D. Yeah. And just to finish that uh, that thought, this you know variations on a theme happen in multiple places throughout Eurasia. Mm. And what happens today is when people in these environments don't have their natural indigenous vitamin D rich diets, they get very unhealthy and often very quickly. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's another case of, of, you know, untoward consequences, unexpected consequences, like in Australia, people are spending most time indoors. They're not getting enough vitamin D. In these cases, uh, where people dispersed into high latitudes, everything was okay when they had a vi vitamin D-rich diet. But then if they stop eating vitamin D-rich foods for whatever reason, then they really get into strife with all sorts of serious problems, not only with, with bone development, classic sort of developmental problems, but also a host of immune system and cardiovascular problems. Yeah, it's fascinating how, you know, you are you kind of look at it and go, isn't it amazing that these populations figured out that they had to compensate some way, but in the same way they had to by definition because the populations that didn't figure it out aren't around anymore. So you that's know, right. The the cog and it's not like these and it's not like these folks were sort of sitting around scratching their heads saying, Oh, how are we gonna get vitamin D? Yeah, well, it's they didn't like, know. They they just that's right. They knew, but they didn't know. Yeah, um, you know, and 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 clearly, you know, the lineages that were doing the right thing with respect to sun exposure and and vitamin D consumption clearly had the greater reproductive success, and that's what evolution is all about. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before in the early 90s when you were first looking into this, mm -hmm. you were wondering whether we were ready to have this conversation as a, yeah. as a society. I wonder now, given the amount of research that is coming out, mm -hmm. looking at the, the impact of latitude gradient on, on disease profiles, are yeah. we ready in our society to have a discussion about how skin color and where we live is affecting our health outcomes you know are we in a place where at doctor's office offices you know let's say in scotland if you have someone who's um who's yeah. got african heritage are we at a point where a discussion needs to be had saying look you have a lot of pigmentation um you need mm. to do some things to compensate for that because you're living in the wrong place uh, are we are we at a point where we can start to talk about this we're getting there and I'm optimistic that we're getting there faster than we were 20 years ago. Uh, and I'm reasonably optimistic. The medical establishment has been slow, to be honest, to, uh, to incorporate evolutionary perspectives on the human condition. But I'm happy to say that that, that situation is changing rapidly. And this has in part been pushed by the clear relationship of skin pigmentation to health uh, because it's become abundantly clear to lots of, of medics, even those who don't know very much about human evolution, that in fact, skin pigmentation is 
sometimes better matched, or I don't like to use the term mismatched, but um, there are individuals who clearly are doing better under certain conditions and not so good under under those conditions. And so um, I'm happy to say that things are gradually changing and, and doctors are realizing that they need to have this knowledge, but many of them are still very concerned about bringing this to patients because they themselves feel some insecurity about talking about human variation. Yeah. Skin color especially has been so fraught with uh with you know the ghosts or the the specters of of discrimination and bias that doctors themselves feel reserved and insecure about talking about this. And so one of the things that I've been doing a lot of in the last four years especially is trying to give people the vocabulary to speak about this because it's so important to be able to speak to someone about their about their skin pigmentation. In Australia, there have been abundant conversations with people who have lightly pigmented skin uh, about their skin cancer risks. I mean, to the extent that doctors, dermatologists especially, talk themselves blue and have no problem, you know, expounding at length on this. But they have not thought about talking to people with more darkly pigmented skin, whether those people are Aboriginal Australians, people from the India, South Asian, uh, uh, South Asia broadly, the Indian subcontinent, or people of African descent. So, you know, we now have to sort of sit back and say, okay, we can do this. And what I try to convey to doctors is that we can talk about humans as products of evolution, all humans all aspects as products of evolution. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. And when you speak to people in forthright terms without using pejorative language, which is super important, you, you basically say, you know, this is the way it is. You have this skin color, this is your lifestyle, this is your age. Let's figure out how you can stay healthy. And so things are gradually changing. But because many, especially older practitioners, uh, feel insecure about having these conversations, and when they feel insecure, that that sort of unease gets transmitted to their patients and everybody yeah. sort of freezes up. Yeah. So, you know, I I say often that we make progress with every retirement and funeral uh, in that when generally when younger practitioners who have had some background in evolutionary medicine come into practice, they feel more confident about their knowledge base and about the vocabulary of having the discussion. So I am hopeful. That's uh, that's really good news. It's something you know, I work at a hospital and, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're in Western Sydney where, you know, it is one of the most culturally diverse places yeah. uh, in the world and um, trying to explain to people who, you know, live and work indoors that, yeah. you know, we evolved outside all the time and, you know, yeah. we, we can't replace that with, um, you know, screwing light bulbs at home and, you know, that melanin in, in the skin is absolutely amazing because it's actually, I mean, if you look at stains where they stain the melanin, you see it's, yeah. it's just all around the nucleus. It's absolutely fascinating yeah. protecting the genetic material. Um, yeah. and, but it's also stopping, uh, stopping the UV from interacting with us in a positive way. So yes. there has to be some balance there. And I think that all comes yeah. down to that word balance. Um, yeah. And, and I think people recognizing that, you know, that, yes, we're really clever and smart. And we do all these things with technology, but we still have these sort of old bodies insofar as, as you know, our, our 
our flesh, uh, our brains are still products of evolution that that basically sort of stopped changing in major ways about two hundred thousand years ago. So you know we have to we have to make cultural modifications. A lot of my colleagues and friends and relatives say, "Oh, it's not natural to take supplements," or "It's not natural to." And I just say. What you're doing in your life isn't natural by that definition. Yeah. You know, living inside, you know, playing games for seven hours a day, that's not natural. So, you know, we just have to wise up, look at our own lifestyles and conditions and make the appropriate changes. And we can do this easily. We, you know, we can modify our diet. We can modify by taking supplements if necessary and we can engage in some cautious sun exposure. In Australia, there's a lot of emphasis on avoiding overexposure of your face and hands and the areas that are that are normally exposed a lot in just day-to-day -day movements. But you can, you know, occasionally expose other areas of your body, your back, you know, to the sun for a short period of time. And my goodness, our solar battery is really good at converting UVB wavelengths into pre uh, pre vitamin D in the skin. Well, the, the the UVB wavelengths interact with a cholesterol like compound to make the vitamin D precursor, and then you know we're away. And you don't have to be out there for very long for there to be a rather profound biological effect. I wanted to ask you about this vitamin D story. Um, I was very passionate about the effects, the positive impact of mm. vitamin D on health a few years ago. And the more people I've spoken to, the less enthusiastic I've been about mm -hmm. the impact of vitamin D. Uh, it seems as though we do a lot of epidemiological studies and yeah. the people with the highest vitamin D levels have the best health outcomes. And yeah. then the hypothesis is formed that vitamin D is protective. So we run clinical yeah. trials, we supplement vitamin D and the benefits are not there. And yeah. it seems to me as though the benefit is in sunlight itself, not precisely in the vitamin yes. D molecule. And that vitamin D, elevated vitamin D in the blood is merely a proxy marker for living outside in sunlight. Yeah. And uh, I would, yeah, I, I think that's that's a very good series of points. And I think vitamin D is just one of the positive outcomes of, of natural sunlight exposure. Uh, because we know that, you know, when ultraviolet wavelengths impact and, and, you know, total solar wavelengths impact the skin, but especially ultraviolet is the most biologically active, that these not only affect vitamin D precursors, but a host of other bioactive molecules. I mentioned the effect on bioactive folates. We now know, uh, and this is a result of work that has been done on one of my former postdocs, Tony Wolf, and my colleague, Larry Kenny, uh, all at Penn State, who have looked at sort of the combined effects of, of folate and vitamin D on vasodilation, right? On the, on preserving vasodilation in the skin, which is really important for thermoregulation. So it was, it, it still is important while we're exercising, but you can imagine just how important it was when we were much more active several thousand years ago, chasing prey or being chased by prey. Um, it, in our history, when we built up a lot of muscular heat that needed to be dissipated into the environment. So you need to have a lot of vasodilation so that you can uh, provide uh, water uh, to sweat glands, as well as simply provide more blood flow to the skin for radiative 
and conductive heat loss. So it turns out, and this this work you can read in in several papers that we've published about the the importance of sunlight, you know, in this in this balance of of maintaining uh, proper vasodilation. You're you're right in saying that the vitamin D synthesis is just a marker. Uh, because it's an important marker, and there's no doubt that vitamin D, as it as it affects other organs when it's produced in the skin, is important. But what happens in the skin, and importantly, what happens over years of of regular exposure? Many of these clinical studies that are being done now people get vitamin D for, you know, a few years, maybe even up to five years, but they're not being exposed in a systematic way to sunlight that is able to produce uh, pre-vitamin D and vitamin D in the skin and have other effects also. And one of the problems in doing this kind of, of experiment is the the health and safety protocols that are involved now. It's very hard to get permission, for instance, for you know any kind of whole body radiation, let alone you know on a on a sort of year in year out basis over the course of of several years, because I would venture it is under those conditions that you really see the benefit when you have a human body that has been more regularly accustomed to some UV, UV exposure uh, outdoors during life. So, you know, getting, simulating this in, you know, in a laboratory experiment or even in a sophisticated, you know, prospective epidemiological s- study is really tough and it's yeah. really expensive. And and of course, getting people to control their own sun exposure, record it, you know, all you, you can imagine. Yeah. It, yeah. This is not easy. But I'm confident that we will get there with respect to providing more balanced prescriptions, as it were, for sun mm-hmm. exposure according to you know, people's ancestry, their age, where they live, what their habits are, and so forth. I think we may not have that perfect, you know, knockout experiment, but we'll have enough data uh, within the next five years to be able to say, okay, yeah, um, here's, here's a little calculator that you can use. And if you go out, you know, at this time of day, in, at, at your current latitude, you know, and you expose your back or your upper arms or your thighs, areas that are not normally exposed, if you expose them for a while, you'll be much better off. And, you know, quite honestly, I think the chronic lack of sun exposure uh, and the problems with vasodilation that are related to this are one of the reasons that we see such high levels of hypertension in darkly pigmented people worldwide. Uh, in addition to you know the, a host of other problems related more specifically to vitamin D deficiency. So you know I think we just have to not, not just idly hope, but plan for prospective experiments that and and uh, and in vivo lab experiments of a circumscribed nature that will allow us to pin this down better. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the work of of as I said mentioned earlier my my former postdoc Tony Wolf who's now at the University of Georgia. He's doing some great stuff and I and I hope that we might get this personalized prescription as a result of some of his and his colleagues work yeah it's very very difficult at a um public health level to talk about things like this because it is so individualized and 
Yeah. Uh, there's a dermatologist in the UK, Richard Weller. Um, yes. Who, yes. Um, I know him well. Yeah. Well, he, um, one of his colleagues told me uh, his patients that come in with um, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma, he goes, oh, you're going to live a long life because you've been out in the sun. Um, so he uses that as a proxy to tell to tell him the people that have been out outside and um, because yeah. generally those cancers are uh, not as uh, dangerous as yes. melanoma uh, and they yeah. can, they're, they're more superficial, they can be cut out and that's sort of the end of it. Yes. Um, those are often predictors of, of better health outcomes because of yes. the sun exposure. Um, yeah. I guess it gets a little bit more complex with melanoma because the epidemiology of melanoma is a little bit all over the place. Um, some, yes. some show inverse correlation with sunlight, some show correlation with sunburn in childhood, and it's yeah. you know it's it's really not a linear relationship, um, and yeah. that's what worries me about the messaging, particularly here in Australia, where um, most people just think the sun is toxic, and that's and that's that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, not not for you know, and for good reason, but yeah, it's going to be difficult at a, at a public health level to discuss this in a more nuanced way. Um, and yeah. I think, I think your work is, is actually quite pivotal to starting that discussion. Yeah, I think it's helpful. And I think also, you know, if we look at patterns of modern sun exposure or lack of sun exposure, uh, we all already mentioned that we're inside most of the time. And when we go outside, uh, this is less true perhaps in Australia than it is in most of North America and Eurasia, when people go outside uh, and they decide, I need some sun, they go out for you know strong, episodic sun exposure. So when we talk about melanoma risk, it's often in conjunction with this wham, you know, two weeks, you know, in Mexico or two weeks, you know, on the Mediterranean or two weeks in Queensland, you know, absolutely, you know, frying themselves. Actually, in, in most parts of Australia, you don't necessarily have to go to Queensland. Um, and, you know, I think that that message, that avoidance of unprotected or poorly protected strong episodic sun exposure is probably a good one because, you know, and, and people get it. It's like when you get to your vacation destination, don't just rip off your clothes and, you know, get out in the sun, be cautious and be healthy. So, you know, I think that I I've had a fair amount of success in discussing uh, the, UV expert Brian Diffie from the UK wrote some wonderful papers over the last 30 years about what he called the vacation effect. Basically, the, the importance of avoiding strong episodic UVB exposure, especially uh, in connection with melanoma risk. Yeah. 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 It's really fascinating that it seems like if you read the literature on melanoma, the, there's two ways to protect yourself from it. And one is never to go out in the sun. And the other <laughs> is to be chronically exposed uh, to an appropriate yes. dose. Um, but the, where, where the problems really come is like you say, this episodic, um, this, yeah. Um, yeah, this transient exposure when your skin is not ready to receive, it's not, it hasn't uh, acclimated to that level. Yeah. And unfortunately that describes basically all the exposure patterns of, of modern humans. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes, it is. And, and, you know, and the greatest vulnerability of course, will be in the people who have the most strongly depigmented skin. So those from the extremities of, of Northern Eurasia, who go to, uh, go to a very sunny place uh, will come badly unstuck. So some of the earliest uh, uh, colonists in Australia and the Americas and uh, European colonists in Africa came, you know, came what well, became very, very ill as a result of, of solar overexposure because they were so lightly pigmented to begin with. 
Mm. Have you heard of, there was a paper published maybe three or four years ago that looked at how the endorphin system is influenced by exposure to UV light. Yeah. And they didn't say it in, in this way, but it looked as though the way that this endorphin system is set up, it leaves people who are more darkly pigmented, more susceptible to addictive behaviors. And yeah. I found this to be really quite fascinating because it, you know, it makes this connection between certain vulnerabilities um, of yes. people in, in society where, you know, it's only been in the last few hundred years we've had people living yeah. outside of uh, where their skin is adapted to. Um, and, you know, I often wonder how much this is playing into the the differences in health outcomes between different uh, yeah. subsets of within a population. There, there are, I am sure, many, many phenomena that we need to explore better. I am familiar with this because mm -hmm. uh, at, at Penn State University, Professor Gary King has looked at the relationship between melanin pigmentation and ease of addiction to nicotine. Mm. So although people, uh, it, and he was particularly looking at African-Americans who generally are not as as addicted as it, within a population in terms of, of sheer numbers mm. as are other members of, of the other populations in the country. But when they do become steady smokers, they find it very difficult to quit because of a, of a high level of addiction. So this, this is something that is still not well understood at a biochemical or epidemiological level. And is it, is it only for people with African ancestry or can you have dark pigmentation from Sri Lanka or Bougainville, uh, you know, there because there are there are again lots of different complements of genes that create dark and highly tannable skin, just like there are different complements of genes that lead to mostly depigmented skin. So, you know, there's just so much that can be done here. And again, this is a case where we have to look dispassionately at the problem and describe it clearly yeah. and in a non-pejorative way, not using inflammatory language. It's tough because our vocabulary is really depauperate, right? We, we have exhausted a lot of the available words for describing people, for describing skin color. And so when we talk about these phenomena, we have to be as clear and non-pejorative as possible. And, and even then, you know, it can be a, a hard thing to, for many people to get their heads around. But I feel that we must have these inquiries into, you know, what, what makes us human, what confers health, how can we as individuals with our unique complements of genes be healthy? You know, so I think we'll get there. It's just we may not get there in my or even your lifetimes. <laughs> well, I think we're making some progress. Um, and, you know, this seems like a pretty good segue into the fact that you sort of split your book up into two sections, biology and yeah. society. Um, I'm really interested to ask you about the society aspect because it's mm. something I basically know nothing about. So, um, yeah. you know, clearly our evolutionary past is plagued with prejudice based on the color of skin. And, mm. you know, I guess probably for you more than more than most, you mm. see how absurd this is because you realize mm. that skin color is just how much pigmentation you have done based on your, you know, where your yeah. ancestors lived. So, you know, this whole thing is just based on this illusion essentially that, that, there's a yeah. difference of some some description. Um, so how yeah, how is this shaped? What what I would say, Cameron, is that it's not so much that we have we have an evolutionary history of skin color discrimination and bias because 
what we see when we look at human history as opposed to prehistory mm -hmm. is that color-based discrimination in the sense of modern discrimination where we treat people differently according to color is to many people surprisingly recent mm. and mostly maps on to the European enlightenment of the mid 18th century going forward and the era of European colonization mm. of, of you know, other lands. And, you know, to make a long story short, this means that when we look at the history, the, the facts of history, when we look at the early classifications of humans that were done by naturalists like Linnaeus or philosophers like David Hume or Immanuel Kant, what we see are these white guys in Europe, who had very limited information on the nature of human populations in different places. They relied mostly on explorers and travelers' tales, second, third, and fourth hand reports, uh, often not very good reports, mm -hmm. in order to make their pronouncements about how humans should be classified and regarded. So Linnaeus starts out with, you know, a simple fourfold classification, color and continent. So you have white people in Europe, black people in Africa, red people in, uh, in the Americas, and yellow people in Asia. You know, and Interestingly, Linnaeus didn't create a hierarchy. He just created this series of types. But very soon thereafter, Kant, Buffon, and others basically take this idea of human types and say, no, we can really, we can make this much clearer. And we see lots and lots of different classifications of humans coming up in the 1770s, 1780s, and 1790s. Most of these rely on color, uh, skin color, as the primary sorting characteristic. But then they add other characteristics, and they add characteristics of personality mm. and culture. So, you know, all of a sudden you have these biological classifications that have, you know, characteristics of moral judgment and character and lawfulness that are included along with skin color yeah. in order to classify people. I mean, if this weren't absurd enough, what we then see is the fairly whole-scale adoption of these schemes in political systems in Europe and the Americas, in part, in large part, because they reinforced the transatlantic slave trade. Never underestimate the power of money and economics. And, you know, it just so happened that all of these classifications were beginning to come out, especially the ranked classifications of Hume and Kant were coming out just as the transatlantic slave trade was really being threatened by abolition. Oh, but it's so easy it to justify the enslavement of people, the continued enslavement and transport of people if they are not as equal as mm -hmm. the people at the top of our racial hierarchy. And so, you know, this is, this is the sinister part, the really sinister part of this story. You've got these cl color-based classifications, classifications that include personality traits and traits about moral failings or, or moral merits, and, and other, you know, important cultural attributes. And then you have the economic influences 
of the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism in much of the world. And what you have there is the recipe for the reinforcement of racial, uh, strict Mm -hmm. racial disparities, strict classification by types of Mm -hmm. people, color-based. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but to some extent, we have not left that era. Although we're more aware of these problems, when you look at the history of race relations Mm -hmm. broadly in Australia, in the Americas, in, you know, throughout much of Eurasia, especially in Europe, what we see is the legacy of those really bad and inappropriate classifications. Mm. They were reinforced not only by pseudoscience and economics, but also by religion. Yeah. You know, so that you have all of these these pseudo mythologies from religion, uh, from science, being marshaled in support of these of these race classifications. So now we have the difficult job of trying to undo this two hundred and fifty plus years of an absolute mess. And it's made harder because in many countries, these classifications are still reflected in official government instruments like the census, right? In in my country, in the United States, we still have a census in which the categories are basically the same categories that were created in the 1790s with some minor modifications. Thank goodness we are moving on from that, Mm. but it's taken far too long. And, you know, needless to say, this is, this is a very hard job, Mm. but what I enjoy doing Cameron is basically telling people sort of the short story about the history of race, especially introducing people to the idea that race is not a biological thing. Yeah. That people have different skin colors. The same skin colors have evolved multiple times. That there are these other traits, you know, visible and invisible traits that vary in different patterns. And that humans are basically a, a glorious, beautiful mishmash. And the that the labels that we have affixed to these, these, you know, groups that were thought to exist are really a really bad mistake yeah. that we're yeah. trying now to undo. This is tough, but at least when you when you talk to kids, especially, and I spend a lot of time now writing for kids, it's like they get it. They get mm. it immediately. Like, whoa, what's all the fuss about? Yeah. And if we can have a planet full of people who say, well, what's the fuss about? Let's just try to work this out. Mm-hmm. We'll be a bet a lot better off. Yeah. Again, yeah. this isn't going to happen in our lifetimes, but we can work toward it. Yeah, it seems like we've made at least some progress, uh, particularly recently, uh, with regard to this. Um, I wonder though, there seems to be an increasing emphasis on uh, things like pride about race and yeah. and pride in in yeah. skin color how how does this how does this match up i mean do you see the ideal yeah. scenario a, a society where we don't talk about race hmm. at all or you know it's 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 a difficult sort of crossroads in that in that sense yeah. isn't it it's it, it's it's a it's a situation that requires some maturity and willingness to say boy this is a messy situation yeah yeah you know, I have this skin pigmentation and, you know, I was classified in this particular way. And I feel an affinity with people who look like me or have yeah. the, look like me and share the same religion or share the same ethnicity, yeah. uh, you know. And so there's there's this important aspect of identity that cannot be taken away from people, yeah. especially when they share an identity of shared suffering 
and yeah. shared adverse discrimination as opposed to positive discrimination. That you cannot you cannot take that away from people because that is an important part of their own personal heritage, their family heritage, their lineages heritage. But what you can say is, okay, folks, you know, this is true. You have suffered as a result of this of this race label and, and race-based discrimination. But let's recognize it for what it is. Let's work to ameliorate it to the greatest extent possible. And let's recognize that over and above these race names and differences, we are one humanity. We share virtually everything in common. We all, you know, we all eat broadly the same kinds of foods. We all like to do the same things. We like to be with families. We like to have our kids educated. We like to party. We like to dance. We like to listen to music. I mean, we are just unified by so many things. So I guess this requires some, you know, maturity yeah. uh, and just willingness to say, I hear you. You know, I understand where you're coming from and I'm not going to demean your journey, especially if you have suffered the most severe kinds of depredations as a result of physical segregation. In my country, in the United States, where I work in South Africa, the legacies of durable physical segregation are yeah. real and painful. So you you talk about those openly and just say, we got to do better and we share a common humanity. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, maturity is the key. Um, unfortunately, with topics like this, it's sometimes difficult to, to find from a lot of people. Um, yeah, and I guess that's one of the reasons that I'm emphasizing the importance of, of early childhood education so that kids learn how to have conversations about this before they turn into difficult conversations. Mm. Yeah, you write about, this was my next question uh, in the book you speak about um, basically how intuitive kids are with their surroundings. Yeah. And even though they may not understand the language that you're using, uh, the kids are smart, you know, they can put things together at a very, very young age. And, you know, how how has this shaped the way that you um, that you uh, speak around kids and make sure that they're not picking up, you know, uh, yeah. any language that might be that might embed itself yeah. in in their in their psyche. Well, I think what's so interesting about kids is that, of course, they're quick studies, yeah, and they learn not only from words, but they learn from facial expressions and gestures. So if they're watching one of their caregivers uh, or their parents uh, watch the TV and or the, the screen and the parent or the caregiver responds in a particular way, positive or negative, they don't have to say anything. Yeah. They can just look in a particularly approving way or smile or scowl and, you know, roll their eyes, you know, and kids pick up immediately on that. So it's a matter of, as, as I often refer to it, immunizing kids, yeah. just like a vaccination, by giving them some really basic information. I've written two kids' books, and I'm getting ready to write a, a third book for youths and, and adults, more of a graphic novel treatment. Because I think when kids know that, okay, you know, somebody might be treating me differently because of my skin color, the way I look, mm -hmm. but I know that that's just baloney that it's you know that that they're wrong and that i'm i am beautiful as i am and i am you know i am a real authentic human being yeah so i think we can't stop people from saying you know we can't stop caregivers from rolling their eyes or saying you know offhand remarks but we can give kids the information that can allow them to evaluate and just say, well, 
yeah, this that that facial expression wasn't very nice, and and it, you know these these people, everybody everybody's the same, mm. you know, and uh, I I've seen this. I've seen little kids, seven, eight years old, you know, respond really positively and intuitively, as you as you noted, uh, you know, to these messages. And I think that exposure can be profound and impactful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you write about categorical thinking and minimal group paradigm bias. Um, in, yeah. in the society section. And I was wondering that given our tendency towards these things the, of, of needing to categorize uh, our, the things in our environment in order to make decisions and to move forward, has the the battle that we've had with racism, is that an inevitable consequence of the way that we have developed? Or is is this something you think if we rolled the clock back and replayed everything eventually would get to a point where this didn't happen or is this just an an inevitable speed bump we had to get over i i think it is more of the of the latter i think this is a speed bump i think as much as i would like to to roll the the clock backward and roll the video back mm. i think you know it's it's out uh and w- there is no negation in the subconscious. And so when you, you know, when something comes out, you know, however favorable or unfavorable, it's out there. Mm. Uh, And it's out there for, you know, these days for many other people to consume uh, in, in various kinds of media, including podcasts. So, so I think we have to recognize that this is, a human tendency mm. and and simply understand that this is a vulnerability just like we have physical vulnerabilities yeah. physiological yeah. vulnerabilities Absolutely. this is a psychological vulnerability <laughs> yeah yeah that's a great way to look at it um knowing mm. knowing where you're weak um makes you stronger yeah. yeah yeah it does because you you can you can again you know, recognize the early symptoms of this malady and and then, you know, put the brakes on. So I think going forward, we know a lot about prevention. Yeah, definitely. Um, what are you working on at the moment? Too much stuff. <laughs> but um, like I said, one of the things that I'm working on is the the very beginnings of a of a graphic novel treatment about how we how we came to be, how we got here, yeah. how we got here with respect to how we think about human diversity. Uh, and I think that could be quite a bit of fun. It's still in the very early stages. And then I'm also, I, and I have been for years gathering all the resources to do a book on hair because you know just like skin and skin pigmentation are interesting topics from an evolutionary and social perspective hair is gorgeous from the from those perspectives and you know for as much as people think that hair doesn't count it's not socially important i ignore my hair dot 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 everybody obsesses about their hair, you know, whether they admit it or not. And it turns out that our hair has a terrifically uh, fascinating heritage, our scalp hair, as well as brow hair and beard, facial hair, the, the whole thing. So so that those two books I'm working on, and then various projects with a lot of uh, work with doctors, trying to move forward on the on the classification of humans and how we can fix that, and give doctors better tools to speak with patients as well as undertake diagnosis. Yep. And yep. Uh, yeah, and just do a lot of consciousness raising amongst uh, the bi- well in the biomedical sphere as a whole. That's absolutely fascinating. I've always wondered about hair. Um, how did our ancestors used to cut their hair? 
They didn't have scissors. I've always wondered that. We have, uh, well, I think there were, there were probably a few things at play. First of all, I think for much of our early history, we had tightly curled hair that would naturally break when it got to a sort of a clumsy or dangerous length. I don't think we had originally sort of long, flowing, straight scalp hair. I think it was more curly in our ancestors. Having said that, there were no doubt ways that people styled their hair, probably using mud, clay, naturally occurring compounds, People were very good, became very good at braiding stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Making simple, you know, braids in their hair and, and figuring out ways to sort of restrain their hair. When they started cutting it is unclear. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to my archaeological colleagues until I'm blue in the face and they're about ready to throw something at me trying to draw them out about how people cut their hair. And can we investigate this by looking at the edge wear on stone tools, for instance? We don't know when people started cutting their hair. Certainly they did develop that ability. And, and when people, when certain groups of people evolved not only long, but straight hair, this became more of an issue. But I think long before we were cutting it, we were styling it in various ways, you know, with with compounds, with sticks, with bones, you know. I, mean, I, I think people were just incredibly creative and we were using hair as a decoration, just like we decorated our skin. That's fascinating. I can't wait to read that when you uh, when you get around <laughs> to writing that book. That'll be a great. I'm excited about it. I mean, I've, it's been I've been collecting information on this for this book for about ten years now. So I'm wow. I'm I will soon get around to it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, I won't take up too much of your time because I know you're you're very busy and it's getting late um, over where you are. Um, I I'm extremely grateful that you've taken some time to speak with me. Um, this has been wonderful. I've learned a lot. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Cameron. And because you were so well prepared for the interview, having actually read some of, of the material from my book, Living Color, and maybe some other things, um, I really enjoyed speaking with you. It's always nice to speak with, with well-informed people who ask good questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I never ask people to come on unless I know their stuff well enough to have the conversation Good. without reading notes all the time. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I think it's I think it's really making an impact. And I hope more people um, read the book. I'll just there it is. It's a great, great, great cover. Thank as you. Well. Beautiful palette on there. Um, yeah. yeah. Fascinating, fascinating book. I recommend everyone read it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in reading Nina's work, I've left links to all of her books and her websites in the episode notes. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can subscribe so you get notified whenever I release a new episode. I'd also encourage you to leave a five-star review or give a thumbs up if you like the episode. This is a simple no-cost way to support my work and help me reach more listeners. Please feel free to leave comments on my YouTube channel as well, as I do try and read through as many as I can. I've put links to all of my social media platforms in the episode notes if you'd like updates about the podcast, information about health, or if you'd just like to reach out to me in general. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.